Hello everybody, welcome back to No Trailers Allowed, my movie and streaming show podcast where I do not watch trailers beforehand. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more episodes on my website, superjersh.com. You can get this podcast early and ad-free and support me by visiting patreon.com slash superjersh. You can find my No Trailers Allowed content social medias online uh, on Twitter at No Trailers Pod and on Instagram at No Trailers Allowed. You can email me to be a part of the show with your questions, comments, or suggestions uh, by using the email address notrailersallowed at gmail.com. Uh, I do have a free public Discord as well, and I have a new uh, No Trailers Allowed dedicated movie discussion channel, so check out the Discord if you're new. Uh, this is uh, on YouTube as well, so if, if you are listening to this uh, podcast on Spotify or iTunes or on Patreon, please make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel to help it grow as well. I have a link to that uh, channel in the description. Um, I do want to remind folks here that I do have a music channel as well, youtube.com slash superjersh, uh, if you want to hear my uh, thoughts on music and music reactions. Also, I have uh, a video game YouTube channel, uh, and I stream live on twitch.tv slash jershplays. I want to do a quick Patreon shout out. I want to welcome new patrons Thomas, Igor, and Adrian. Uh, I want to thank Patreon executive producers Mirrors, Tris, I Love Manatees, and Daryl for your longtime uh, support. And thank you as well, legendary Patreon producer Zelbinian. As I said a moment ago, uh, we are on Spotify and iTunes as well. I do sincerely dislike Spotify. I've not, I've almost never liked Spotify, and especially. At the time of this recording of recent events, I, there's reason even less to like Spotify. So if we're lucky, it will die, and then you can listen to this other places. Uh, but yeah, rate and subscribe where you can while they exist. On this episode, I'm going to talk about Last Night in Soho. Before I get into discussing the latest movie from Edgar Wright, I felt like I should share kind of where I am with the majority of his films, or at least uh, the bigger movies that most people associate with him. Um, so he had this sort of like Cornetto trilogy that he calls it with uh, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and The World's End, and then he had Scott Pilgrim and Baby Driver, um, and that's a lot of the movies he was attached to Ant-Man for some time, but didn't end up making it. And uh, now recently, four, four or five years since his last movie, Baby Driver, we finally get Last Night in Soho. Uh, I absolutely love Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. Uh, I think they're brilliant movies. They're super fun. They're like almost infinitely rewatchable for uh, the dialogue, the character performances, the camera work, uh, just the high energy and fast pace uh, wit and cleverness of both of those movies. I think they're really great. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost uh, have incredible chemistry to watch in both of those movies for different reasons and similar reasons. Uh, the World's End I, I liked uh, less. Uh, I watched it once and don't remember a lot of it. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, that's the weaker of those three movies. For Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, I really loved that movie. I, I like watched it randomly on HBO one night, not knowing anything about it, not knowing it was based on like having never seen a trailer, surprise, or um, you know, knowing that it was based on some sort of graphic novel property or video game uh world. I saw gaming references, which caught my attention. And it was like only after the movie was done that I re that it was I saw that it was directed by Edgar Wright and whatever. See, I love Scott Pilgrim versus the World. I, I like the music in it. The and I mean, talk about a cast! Like that movie came out in like oh nine or two thousand ten, and like nine or ten characters deep in that movie, uh, they like all became kind of stars in their own right, even if they had like small bit supporting bits in that movie. So it's kind of crazy. So love Scott Pilgrim. Uh, Baby Driver, I really didn't like. I was really disappointed in it, to be honest. Um, that was definitely a movie that was like style over substance. It kind of was meant to be 
a sort of like two hour long music video where it really was just like syncing up video images with music as far as like the car chase and the gun fights and stuff like that. And so for the style of it and the technical prowess of it to pull that off and put all that together and have it work and and the editing that that you know, and timing that that all must have taken, I really appreciated and respected that aspect. Um, but it's not a movie that I've ever felt com- compelled to revisit. And that's aside from, you know, the real world implications of, you know, the allegations, alleged allegations against uh, Kevin Spacey and um, uh, Ansel, whatever, the kid that plays the baby driver character. He had some, I heard online some allegations against him. I don't know. I don't, I don't follow it closely. I, I like am vaguely aware of those types of things. Um, but I try to focus on like the movies anyway. Um, yeah, which kind of brings me to last night in Soho, which is a movie uh, that I knew nothing about. I just knew that uh, when it was first announced, you know, I guess a couple of years ago, Edgar Wright's making a new movie. It's called last night in Soho. Uh, it's going to have Anya Taylor-Joy in it. I don't remember if The Queen's Gambit had come out and was a thing at that time. She had already sort of established a name for herself with The Witch and with Split. So I don't know if, again, The Queen's Gambit was on that radar as well, but I knew that she was attached. And so I went radio silent on it. I muted words about it. I didn't watch trailers about it. Uh, it didn't have... Well, when it came out theatrically, I think we were... Um, still in a, in a pretty bad part of the pandemic. I don't remember if even a vaccine was available yet, which thank you, science, for the vaccine. Get vaccinated if you haven't already. I'm double vaccinated and boosted, and, um, you know, I'm alive. Your chances are lower if you don't get vaccinated. Anyway, um, so I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what it was about. Anyway, so I didn't, I didn't go see it in theaters because of the pandemic, and uh, also... I think when I did finally uh, think I would go to the theater for it, uh, when I tried to find it in my area, it already wasn't playing. It did not have a long uh, playing time in theaters. <clears throat> um, so it recently, at the time of this recording, I think within the last week or two, became available uh, on streaming and maybe even for purchase now. I don't know. I know when they released them, uh, on the streaming sometimes that it's just for rent. It's just for early access rent. This one, you could purchase it digitally now. And I think I did see an advertisement uh, recently that is pur- it is purchasable on 4K Blu-ray as well. So because of that, I am going to talk full spoilers uh, about Last Night in Soho. It's been out. Uh, it was released in theaters several months ago. It's been available on digital for several weeks now. So if you... Uh, if you want to hear my thoughts and discussion on it. It is going to be full spoilers. I will say briefly, um, <clears throat> I have mixed feelings on the movie. I do recommend watching it. It was definitely worth the rent. Uh, I'm glad that I saw it because there were um, some interesting things that will stick with me um, that I'll talk about later, I suppose. But overall, I felt like it was kind of a mixed bag. Um, so I still don't think he has topped kind of his best work, which is Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and Scott Pilgrim versus the world um so to talk about kind of what this movie is about it is about a young girl uh named eloise ellie uh who is you know a a small town girl living in a lonely world taking the midnight train going anywhere uh she wants to uh become a fashion designer and gets accepted to a fashion school in london so uh she becomes you know, it's a very fish out of water story where this uh, innocent girl from the countryside gets thrust into the city and the nightlife there and uh, drugs and alcohol and uh, danger and older men chasing after her because of her beauty. And I really felt like the first 30 or 40 minutes of this movie was like very strong. Uh, I was. Uh, kind of captivated by her character and her innocence. They hinted at some sort of like horror movie stuff where she sees ghosts, she sees her mom in the mirror. And I'm like, okay, this is uh, this is going to be cool. And and um, it was very slick. You know, Edgar Wright, uh, that's like such, that's a weird, I guess, kind of descriptor, but Edgar Wright makes slick movies. Like he really thinks about the camera work. I know 
Like, I remember in Shaun of the Dead, there was a special feature where they literally went over the storyboards for the entire movie. Like, him and Simon Pegg in a 30-minute video, they show you, like, a hundred giant uh, whiteboard black marker drawings because they had pre-vised everything about what how they visualized that movie. Uh, and even for the uh, the Grindhouse trailer, Don't, that Edgar Wright directed for uh, the Grindhouse uh, double feature by Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez, even for that short two-and-a-half-minute uh, fictional trailer, which also had Nick Frost in it, um, he storyboarded the hell out of that, too, I remember. So uh, he, he's, uh, he knows that film is a visual medium, and he thinks about the visuals, and the camera work never disappoints. There are fast, smooth, interesting movements, fun framing, and, uh, you know, interesting lighting and wardrobes. Like, the look of the movies are never the problem. It's really, for me, like, if I don't get into an Edgar Wright movie, it's the substance, it's the content of it, it's the maybe the dialogue or the character choices or the plot or lack of plot if it's just about the flash, right? Anyway, so I thought the first third, the first act of the movie is pretty strong. Introducing um, the main character, get I, I like really felt for her. I identified with her. For me, my own personal life, like my personal story really mimicked that. I came from a small town of 2,000 people and a month out of high school, I moved to the big city, 2,000 miles away from everything I'd ever known uh, and lived in, uh, what I'll say Phoenix. It wasn't exactly Phoenix, but it was different suburbs in and around Phoenix. And it was scary. And it was, uh, you know, nerve-wracking and new. And, uh, you know, I really identified with that. And I think a lot of people, even if it's not, I mean, I specifically identified with it from small town to metropolis and being hit with real life. And even if it's not that exact one-to-one -one like I had, I think a lot of people can relate to going from the world that you know or have known your entire life, growing up and being introduced to the grander world and the other points of view and people that exist in it. Um, her roommate, she had a real just shitty roommates uh, who you thought was going to be really nice for like a, just a moment and then the movie very quickly lets you know she's not going to be nice, she's very narcissistic and competitive and uh, talks bad about you behind your back and um, one of the things that I wished had been, that's one of the things that I wish had been paid off in the movie is kind of their conflict, their introduction, their power dynamic. Uh, I really had kind of hoped as the story was progressing, I thought, Here's this meek, small-town character who's going into this dream of a flashback time-traveling to the 60s, and she's identifying with this character named Sandy, played by Anya Taylor-Joy. And I thought, through Sandy, who seemed to be this confident, empowered, uh, talented, impressive figure, almost like a, a role model for uh, Ellie... Yeah, Ellie. I keep, I keep Eloise, right? Yeah. Yeah, Ellie. It's funny. Um, that maybe she would, you know, then become empowered herself and there would be a role reversal and kind of a, uh, a comeuppance for the shitty roommate. But that didn't, that kind of gets lost along the way because, um, I don't know, like the people that you're supposed to root for and character motivations and, and the type of people that you think are the heroes and the villains in the movie switch so much that it's like, I don't, who am I supposed to get behind? Who am I supposed to root for at all besides Ellie? Like Ellie, I think what, uh, was a great character, easily the strongest character, which is good because that's your protagonist. And it was really easy for me to root for her. And I felt for her and that performance was really strong. It asked a lot out of that actor and, um, it was really believable. The small townness, the the changing your hairstyle and changing how you dress and finding your confidence in your um, uh, design class uh, all really came through. And then the manicness and the anxiety and the fear and the sadness all came through as things started to escalate throughout the movie. I really loved the wardrobe and the character things that her character went through a, a lot of a lot of good movies and what i try to replicate in the movies that i had made is is this visual transformation of your characters whether it's just the main character or or even all of the side supporting characters as well and when you think about where she started this innocent hair tight girl in her small bedroom uh alone with her ghost mom 
wearing newspaper for a dress to blonde, black, mascara, ghost face, crying in the rain, you know, bloody nose, going to die. Like her character has been through kind of a journey, a character journey. Um, anyway, yeah. So somewhere towards the point of like when it really started to turn into the psychological horror type thriller stuff is when I started to lose a little bit of interest as I was watching. I started to look at the clock and see, you know, because um, I kept thinking about conflict and stakes. And I wondered, like, what is the conflict of this movie? For the first half of the movie, this fish out of water who finds, you know, who gets away from the shitty roommate and finds this basically time travel bedroom in the in the upstairs of, of an older woman's home, uh, you know, w there wasn't really a lot of conflict. It was just literally us watching the main character, watching other events that happened. You know what I mean? And the events that happened were presumably events that had already occurred. So I just wasn't really sure, like, what the conflict was from a from a plot perspective or what the stakes were like what is at stake for you right now i don't know like you're just time traveling at night which is kind of a fun i mean it's a fun premise i feel like uh there was like a woody allen movie from the early 2000s that did something similar to this where it's like every night i didn't i saw a trailer for it i didn't watch it midnight in paris i think is the movie yeah where it's like every night at midnight, you like time travel to someplace else or something like that. And it was, and I, I only saw the trailer for that movie, but I still thought of it because that's what was happening here. Um, I also want to say like in, in the uh, spirit of, I didn't watch the trailer beforehand, just based on the title alone, I thought it was going to be like a one nighter movie where it was literally about your last night in Soho. Like it was going to be, yeah, like the whole movie was going to take place from, you know, dusk until the morning broke. And it was going to be somebody's last night in Soho. That was like a crazy night. Um, but the phrase last night in Soho, as it pertains to the movie, is like every night that she is dreaming and she's like time traveling back to the 60s and seeing Sandy's story. Um, She's, you know, she's talking about what she did last night in Soho. So it's always like the previous night, not last final, it's last prior. Um, so that was kind of fun to learn throughout the movie. <clears throat> Excuse me. I thought Anya, I, I thought all the performances, honestly, across the board were, were really great. Uh, the Matt Smith character was, uh, they successfully, to me, kind of romanticized the 60s and made it seem like this place that you absolutely, absolutely wanted to be and live in. And then as the story of the past unfolded, we found out that she was victimized and turned into a prostitute basically against her will. Um, or at least she felt like she had no choice. And uh, how the Matt Smith character went from this like charming, swinging 60s, greased-haired guy that seemed like a guy everybody would want to know to this really uh, menacing kind of pimp character. I thought that that... that twist and that kind of reveal and change occurred really naturally and really um and really well did you know if you support me on patreon.com slash that you can get this podcast early and ad free you probably didn't know that because you're listening to this promotion right now which means you also probably didn't know that there are dozens of hours of patreon exclusive content over there like full album music reactions and full movie watch-along commentaries. So head on over to patreon.com slash superjersh to help the music and movie discussions continue. But I just feel like there's the movie is trying to do maybe too much, and I don't know who it wants you to root for, because I totally was on board. I completely sympathized with Ellie and Sandy and their plight, and because of the way that the men were treating the women in the flashbacks and in the present day, uh, I was completely doubtful of the John character, the the basically Ellie's what became Ellie's boyfriend. Um, I was really, I just was like sus the entire time. Like you're gonna be an asshole. You're gonna end up working. You're gonna be like a modern day Matt Smith. I can't remember the, the Matt Smith character's name. Um, 
I guess it's Jack. Yeah. Um, I fin- I literally just finished the movie like within the last hour. Uh, I like. I watched the movie. I looked up some of the uh, the cast and credits because I was like, "Have I seen them before?" And then I just literally jumped in to record this. So I don't even know. I don't know what the consensus out there for like reviews or thoughts of this movie are. I just wanted to try to share mine, uh, fresh and honest. And then maybe after this, I'll see what uh, other people thought. Um, but uh, and then all the way up to the fact that Sandy is murdered. You're like, we're really hating these men and, and seeing the, these ghost figures, which I thought it was a cool. I actually thought it was a really cool effect. These these ghost figures, these faceless men, and how. Uh, you know what a lovely name how repetitive and redundant the the shittiness gets and how demoralizing and depressing it gets and i feel like <clears throat> everything that we do in life can kind of be uh reduced to a redundancy like if you think of a time every time you take a shower every time you brush your teeth every time you eat a sandwich for lunch or every time you order a pizza you think about all the hundreds of times you've done it over the course of a lifetime uh, and smash cut it together, it's kind of depressing, you know? And <clears throat> it's not, that's not different here. Now, of course, it's even more depressing subject matter with the, you know, you know, wanting to be a singer, wanting to be a performer, and, and having sincere uh, intentions and having that turned on your head and uh, made to become something that you never dreamed that you would become, uh, you know, is sad. So then... um and again, it's funny. So the Terrence, um, Terrence Stamp, uh, who instantly right away, I you know, I assumed it was Jack. It was Matt Smith. And at first I thought I was clever. And then, of course, as the movie reveals itself, it specifically wanted you to think that. It was kind of cheap to, like, have that one half conversation with a police officer that uh literally never went anywhere else it's like it literally like that character didn't do anything he didn't investigate uh we didn't see any investigation on his part we didn't see him try to take down jack we didn't see him try to help sandy we didn't see him do anything except have that one sentence it almost felt like that that character was specifically existed to be a doppelganger for jack just to mess around with your it's just like it was a red herring it didn't feel like an actual character that had really anything to do from start to finish, both in the past and the present day. It literally existed to be a gotcha red herring for the plot twist of the fact that it wasn't uh, Sandy that was killed. It was Sandy who was the killer. Who, uh, uh, you know, in that great sequence, again, you know, the cinematography and the look and the style and the wardrobe and and, and the music... That all was really good. Like, the logistics of it, the style of it was all really good. But the story of, like, who am I supposed to root for? Who are the good guys and the bad guys? I don't know. I just, yeah, I don't know. It just was mixed. I just was mixed on it. Um, Because I didn't, I, the person I thought I was rooting for became the person that I wasn't. And then, like, at the very end, through the climax, it's like the movie wanted you to sympathize with all these horrible men. Like, please help us, help me, help us. We were. Mur-. It's like, yeah, you were murdered, and I guess you didn't deserve to be murdered, but for 90 minutes, you've been the shit show of this movie. The movie has me programmed to be on Sandy's side. And so when you flip, it's an interesting twist, and, and it's a plausible twist. It's not one that I think that I found unbelievable or didn't believe. Like, I totally could believe when you lived her life and had her uh, her tragedy, that she would feel that she was acting um, with justice and uh, repeatedly so, you know? And I thought that that was kind of a fun twist. But to ask me to, like, see the ghosts as victims and root for them against Sandy, I just, my mind and heart didn't know where to go. Um, so the final reveal, kind of, you know, at the end in the, in the last act of the movie where she does the sit-down, and please... Movie characters. If you're in the third act of a movie and somebody hands you something to drink, don't drink it. Just don't drink it. Just stay thirsty or like find your own bottled water. <laughs> I the moment she sipped that tea, I was like, she's fucked. I you know like yeah. Um, but I did not. I did not predict that she was going to actually be Sandy. I thought it was going to be a sister or a relative, or I thought it was actually maybe going to be her mom. That her mom didn't really die, and that this vision 
that she saw in the mirror this whole time was because she was suffering some so, from some sort of psychosis and she never saw ghosts or anything. Um, but her mom was alive and the person she thought was dead was just, an, yeah, a, 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 a figment of her imagination. Um, so that, uh, and that actress that played older Sandy was, did such a great job. Like she was so warm and kind and welcoming in the beginning and then she was absolutely menacing with the music and, and the framing of her. Uh, in that third act and that sit down with the tea and, and going after uh, Ellie with the knife and cutting her on the hand the same way that she got cut. You know, the duality of the characters I, I thought uh, was interesting. But yeah, I, I mean, I was always, always rooting for Ellie and it was the other pieces around it that I didn't think was particularly consistent. Um, yeah. Like what is the plot of like what is the plot of the movie? Small town girl moves to London, time travels in her dreams to solve a murder plot. I feel like I don't know. I feel like we've seen that before, but this is like a hyper stylized version of person sees visions of the past to solve a murder today. Like there's a movie yeah, I don't know, slight spoilers for the main plot of a 20-year-old movie, but there was a movie that was made a while ago called Stir of Echoes starring Kevin Bacon, which was a very good movie, which is, like, very similar to this, which is, I feel like I'm seeing I'm seeing ghosts, I'm seeing visions of today of somebody who was murdered, and I'm trying to solve their murder today, and I'm, you know, yeah, it's like we've seen kind of this plot done before. Um, but... You know, it did have style. I did think the performances were great. And I thought the music was pretty good. Not just the licensed soundtrack stuff, which Edgar Wright is always really good with in all of his movies. Um, but the original score, the uh, the the orchestral music that is, like, written for the movie, I, th I thought was really effective and, and uh, really well done. Um, the movie... I wasn't sure what time period the movie took place in because the start of the movie, the first 15, 20 minutes of the movie, there's not a lot of references to modern technology. They don't specifically say when and where they are, just that we're going to London. London could be any time. And the grain of the movie, the look of the movie, had a 60s or 70s vibe. It reminded me of Don't Look Now. It reminded me of uh, a, a lesser-known movie that I've watched in the last few years called The Editor. It just was, yeah, it felt like it was taking place in the 70s. So to find out it was modern day and then have a flashback to the 60s and the dream sequences was kind of like a shock. I was like, oh, holy shit. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, I enjoyed my time with it, but it's not a movie that I feel compelled to rewatch maybe ever again just because, I don't know, there weren't a ton of surprises. Uh Yeah, there weren't a ton of surprises on the way to the finale. Obviously, in the third act, finding out that uh, Terrence Stamp was not Jack and that the elderly woman was Sandy, uh, those were fun little surprises, I suppose, but it made me conflicted and confused with who I'm supposed to root for and who I'm supposed to root against in basically what I would call the 1960s story timeline, which is 90% of the plot in this movie, right? Because the plot of the, of the present day is... Girl has nightmares and sees the past, tries to solve it. The past is the mystery. That's where, you know, the kind of the, the machinations of the story and the plot move forward is in those flashback time periods, in that kind of time travel time period. I also feel like because Edgar Wright is such a cinephile and such a, a lover of film and in its own right, a fan of movies as well as getting to make movies, I feel like there are, this is probably um, his Shaun of the Dead of like, 60s and 70s psychological horror you know what i mean like there are probably visual references and character references and story beat references to movies i've never heard of or seen i get the feeling like this is another homage movie like Shaun of the dead and hot fuzz was you know hot fuzz were Shaun of the dead of course an homage to zombie movies and hot fuzz an homage to action films the world's end an homage to sci-fi and baby's driver a baby driver kind of an homage to music videos i don't know but I feel like this is, um, again, an homage to a throwback psychological horror where maybe that's why the plot is overly simple and it is maybe sort of predictable. It's like, oh, no, it's actually this person. Oh, no, it's actually that. You know what I mean? But um, 
I don't know. I just, for me, I've seen so many movies and have loved so many movies that um, I really value, you know, new things, not just kind of, you know, better, prettier versions of old things, which I understand is the majority of entertainment these days because a lot of entertainment has been around for a long time. Uh, but yeah, having said that, I don't regret that I saw it. I would recommend people check it out. And um, yeah, I, like I said, you know, things that are going to stick with me, um, I don't know, kind of the, the, well, the dialogue, that's a lovely name, like that repeated over and over and the repetition of life and the things that we do over and over and how kind of almost monotonous and nihilistically pointless it all seems but at the end of the day after you've aged and gone through this life maybe that's just a me thought the movie wasn't really contemplating that but uh, or commenting on that or contemplating that much but um yeah and again i don't know i really felt like the visions of the mom were never really paid off or really went anywhere obviously there was this twist at the end that now she's gonna have visions of sandy because she sees dead people and sandy died in the fire um I don't know if that's supposed to be a good or bad thing because she idolized and grew out of her shell because of Sandy and then she almost died because of Sandy. I don't, I just, so I don't know if it's supposed to be a good or bad thing that she sees her, but um, I would, you know, probably rate this movie 6.5 or 7 out of 10. Like it, it's worth watching and it's a well-made movie and it's a well-performed movie. There's not a ton new here and there's not a lot of reasons to re-watch it, I don't think. Um, there's not a lot of like, dialogue or, or movie moments that kind of stand out to me and there was maybe one or two sequences that that uh maybe i would rewatch on a scene by scene basis the you know the murder scene of sandy and the culmination of the boyfriend there and seeing the visions and the, the, her reflection in the knife like that was a really well constructed couple of minutes of the movie and then uh the third act climax with the fire and sandy attacking her and seeing the flashback of the stairs and feeling the drug effects of the tea that she shouldn't have drank because it was the third act of the movie um so yeah so a lot to appreciate here not a lot to uh want to kind of rewatch i suppose that is going to do it for this episode of no trailers allowed let me know what you thought of this movie spoiler free of course because we are very spoiler averse around here if you want to discuss spoilers please give a healthy spoiler warning whether you are commenting or you are emailing me again that email address is no trailers allowed at gmail.com for any questions comments or suggestions uh, I would love to hear from you. For more episodes of this podcast, you can visit my website, superjersh.com. You can get this podcast early and ad-free by supporting me on patreon.com slash superjersh. Uh, I'm on Twitter at no trailers Pod. I'm on Instagram at no trailers Allowed. I do have a free public Discord that you can join. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel dedicated to No Trailers Allowed. Both of those links are in the show notes, so please check them out. Um, I also make... Uh, music content on youtube.com slash superjersh where I react to and talk about music. I also stream games on twitch.tv slash jershplays and I have a dedicated YouTube channel um, that is almost at 100 subscribers over there so please check that out as well. Again, that link uh, is in the show notes. If you want to listen to this, if you are listening to this on Spotify or iTunes, uh, give us a five-star rating, subscribe where you can, uh, a quick review. It really helps the algorithm and really helps... Um, the word the internet is a crowded place after all as always thank you for watching or listening until next time